And there we go, guys. Welcome to the Soil Matters. And since I'm not the host, I'm going to jump off and I'm going to let the hosts jump right into it, guys. And I'm not sure if I should be the one talking right now because Leighton seems to be driving. But um... <laughs> Sorry about that. I had my, my mic muted. So uh, that being said, welcome, Kimberly. It's so good to see you again. Nice. Have good to see you as well. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we just go ahead and dive right in? And um, Kimberly, tell us about your latest uh, work that you're uh, you're doing. So the big thing now is the push to the online release of Crunchy Dreams of Hashish, our documentary film um, that's scheduled for April 29th. And so we're pretty excited about that to expand, you know, the people who can view it. Um, the other exciting thing is that because of the generous participation of a volunteer translator team led by Overgrow Shop in Brazil, we have the film that on the day of the release will be available with subtitles in five languages. So we have titles that have been professionally translated into English because Frenchie needs English translate subtitles. <laughs> we have the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, and the Italian. Um, so, you know, this is pretty cool. That allows a huge part of the world's population to um, be able to experience it in a language that's comfortable to them. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. That's yeah, great. thank you. So uh, this audience probably doesn't know um, much about Frenchie and his legacy. So maybe you can uh, roll it back and kind of start from the beginning. I mean, what I'll say to the audience here is that Frenchie was an incredible man, a uh, beautiful spirit and soul who was dedicated his whole life to um, creating and, and learning and teaching um, the magic of hashish production. And this is not concentrate, it's hashish the old way. Um, so maybe you can just like un un unspool a little bit about his, his past and his background. Yeah. So um, I think if we go back a step even further and kind of look at the environment that Frenchie was living in when he was a teenager from 17 going towards 18 and was faced with this idea in France that you had to commit to a job and you were going to do it until you were 55 and that that was just going to be your life, the reality of it. And he was kind of freaking out about this. And a friend, uh, one of his best friends who had been hesitating, approached him with a secret. He wanted to turn him on to smoking hashish. And the friend had been hesitant because this concept around hashish was so oppressive in France back in the day that it was deemed that if you consumed it, you would end up being uh, shame to your family, a drug addict, and a burden to society. But contrary to this, Frenchie smoked hashish that day for the first time, some levities, and he says he doesn't remember the experience of smoking as much as he remembers the feeling that it gave him. And it was this freedom of kind of childhood happiness that he hadn't had in a long time. And it brought him back to early memories of his desire to travel. One of his early heroes was a guy named Henri de Montfred, who was a pearl and hashish smuggler back in the day, who made his own boat and smuggled hashish from North Africa to Greece. And this was Frenchie's role model when he was a little kid, of all things. <laughs> and so this hashish opened up these memories. And when he turned 18 and he had legal edge, he said goodbye to France. And he started traveling and he traveled for 18 years and notably went to um, Northern India in the Himalayas and spent about eight seasons making um, traditional concentrate, which is the hand rub charas, working with the live plants in the field um, for eight years alongside local uh, people there learning their technique. And he used to say he didn't go so much with the idea that I'm going to become this master hashishin. He went with the, with the idea that in order to make the best quality cannabis concentrate that you could find, you needed to do it yourself. Because in general, the constraints, and this exists to this day, when you're making a concentrate, it's not very profitable because it's so time consuming to do a high quality product. So if you want to learn to do the best, 
you need to know where they're doing it, learn their techniques so that then you can have self-sufficiency, do that yourself. Um, so after Frenchie traveled for about 18 years and we met during that process at one point, um, we also had a child at one point. So he spent, you know, a period of time taking care of our daughter and doing other things. And then he had this third part, what he called the third chapter of his life, which was where he came to California and he became a, a teacher of hash making and really evangelized this idea that the magic of the plant was in the trichrome heads and that we really should focus on figuring out the best way for the most number of people to be able to do this themselves because you weren't going to get it on the commercial market. And because in doing this, you could provide to a lot of people a plant product, a plant therapy that gave them what he affectionately called an overall sense of well-beingness. And so as part of that, at one point, so we started teaching um, classes. That was around 2015. And he um, went on Instagram and started um, answering people's questions there and kind of teaching through social media, if you will. But we had more and more people saying, I'm never going to be able to come to your class. I'm in a country where it's impossible or I'm never going to be able to have the funds or get the permission to travel to the U.S. because of the visa, the country that I'm involved with. Won't you do something to help us? And so we made a four-part series of his hash making workshop with the help of our documentary filmmaker, Jake Remington. We also had that translated into six languages with subtitles with the same lovely group from Brazil, the Overgrow Shop. And once we had done that, as I was watching Frenchie and Jake work together, it was time for Frenchie to go up north to visit the farmers that he worked with up there. And I said to them, I, I, we had this thought, I was like, you know, watching you, it reminds me of the film Jiro Dreams of Sushi. I don't know if any of you have seen that film. And it's a story of this amazing sushi maker who's 80 years old and he has this Michelin star sushi restaurant um, downstairs in the subway area of uh, one of the main Tokyo subway stations. And every day his son who works with him, who's like 60 at that point, he says to his father, so father, did we, today we make the best sushi possible. And the father would always say, we did pretty good, but we can do better. And it, Frenchie's apprentice, Bell and I, we used to joke with Frenchie like that. We'd say, okay, so Frenchie, today, did you make the best hashish? And he would invariably say, it's pretty good, but I think we can do better. Um, so we decided to track Frenchie with Jake for a couple of years. And make this film about Frenchie making hashish, working with the farmers, highlighting the beautiful, because he also used to say, the quality of his products come from the plants that are grown by these dedicated farmers, these regenerative farmers. It's not something that he's doing. There's artistry in what he's doing, but the magic comes from the love they've put into the plant that made that quality possible for him to, to harvest and create the hashish with. Um, and the film we had, it wasn't calculated because we're not that smart. But it just happened to be, it happened the last year of medical use in California and the transition into adult use. And so we documented a really dramatic period in cannabis culture history when we went from a condition that allowed us to create a beautiful product and sell it directly to the consumer for a price that allowed us to make some money, allowed the farmer to be paid fairly, and the consumer to have something at a reasonable price to a market where we were suddenly obliged to have all these other layers, the dispensary, the distributor, pay these outrageous taxes, which immediately tripled or quadrupled the price of the end product for the consumer. Um, so that's a little bit the snapshot in history of what the film celebrates and documents. So it's kind of a love story from Frenchie to the farmers to everybody who enjoys cannabis. It's also about normalizing that, hey, these farmers are just farmers. This is another agricultural crop. 
And it's also a warning to locations that are just moving into legalization about what not to do when transitioning from a legacy market into a so-called adult use market. So can we talk a little bit more about um, the actual process? Because what, what I don't think anybody understands about this you know, temple balls, jaria, whatever you want to call it, but it actually goes through a fermentation of some kind because you can smoke the flour and then try the hashish that Frenchie would make next. And it was completely different. The buzz, the feeling, the tastes. Can you, can you build on a little bit of that, Kimberly? So I think you're a scientist, but I just want to be careful about our terminology. I don't think it's fermentation that we're talking about here. What's happening is a transformation that's occurring because terpenes, so just for to backstep a little bit, we're talking about taking the resin from the cannabis plant using some kind of sieving methodology, whether that be dry sieving using a traditional screen process to move the material over the screen. So just these small trichome heads are separated from the plant material or an ice water sieving process where similarly, we put the material in water and we create a vortex to gently detach the trichome head from the stock and sieve the water through bags. So we've just collected these trichome heads as clean as possible. And then we take that when we make traditional hashish and we press it with a source of light heat to fuse all the trichome heads together. And in some cases, people will smoke this immediately, but Frenchie was a big fan of aging the material for a while to let the trichome, to let the terpenes, which some terpenes have a natural corrosive ability. If you think paints thinner, that's made from a pine-based terpene or a lot of the cleaners that are being used nowadays, they're made from a citrus-based terpene and there's a kind of natural corrosiveness to this. If we let the material age, it goes through a transformation where any of that residual plant material is dissipated. And some of the lighter um, uh, terpenes may gas off because they have a lot of volatility, but this will create a smoke that's a little smoother and um, more complex according to Frenchie's interpretation is his experience with evaluating the uh, aged hashish. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think there there's different products that come from dry sieve versus uh, ice water hash. Am I correct in that? Or do they, if you age the ice water hash, does it become similar to a tumble ball? Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, honestly, Terpene head is a terpene, I mean, sorry, a trichome head is a trichome head is a trichome head. You know, whether you use a dry methodology or a wet methodology, um, once you dry the sieved material and you press it, it's very similar. I think where we might see some variation is actually at the traditional land race cultivar, because when you look at... Um, when you're making charas in Northern India, this comes from a semi-tropical area. And there's a reason that you're, you know, using your hands to collect this material because it's far more sticky than say, if you jump over the mountains into the Afghan, the high desert kind of environment where the traditional Afghan land races are grown, which are a much um, drier, coarser kind of feel to it. You know, these are very different cultivars and they've responded to the terroir, the environmental conditions that they're growing in appropriately to meet the needs of the plant, both in terms of growth and protection, because we have to remember the trichome heads, after all, as a secondary metabolite, are a defense mechanism for the plant. So though it's used to protect the plant from um, insects, it's also used to create um, a type of ventilation over the top of the leaves in very hot and humid conditions to protect the moisture retention of the plant. Um, so, you know, that's why I think the different 
uh, methodology in terms of uh, harvesting these trichomes from the plant is so different in such a almost near area. You know, when you look at the Himalayas and you just jump over the mountains to Afghanistan, but the plants have responded dramatically different to their environment. So that's where that like difference between the, the gritty feel, like I know a lot of hash makers will talk about, oh, this plant's gonna dump because it's really gritty. Is that a correct assumption or, or way to describe that? I think so. I mean, you know, cultivar is important. Obviously, the environment is also important. Um, but it's true. You know, there are some cultivars that with modern breeding have been um, made to have a, have a better yield because Unfortunately, one of the harsh realities realities of hash making is um, it's not very profitable in comparison to um, making some of the solvent-based concentrates, for example. Yeah, I, I hear that. <clears throat> it's typical in, in this day and age that there's ways to cheat on everything. <laughs> well, and that's why one of the other things that Frenchie was really focused on was sharing the do-it-yourself technology, um, both because you can control the quality of what you're doing, but also because um, it just feels like in this day and age, it's harder and harder for people to find quality natural concentrates or concentrates that maybe haven't been too manipulated. Or And this way you also control, especially if you're using them for a therapeutic reason, what's actually in them because some of these oils or or even some hashish for that matter there's a very in interesting account on um instagram and i'm going to butcher the name it's irazim um and they've been they've been showing how the so-called gold seal to, so traditionally back in the day you know we're talking 40 50 years ago there was a gold seal afghan hash that was um, known to be quite good. Um, but nowadays that's very much uh, not the case. And they, so they were giving demonstrations of how they take a very inferior, almost like byproduct of the good hash making, and they put it in these big in dis industrial kind of drumming things, and they add all kinds of very suspect stuff to it to create a kind of putty that they then package and sell as this gold seal. So it was kind of this horror show of how something can be, manip be manipulated to look far better in terms of quality than it actually is and sold to a public that doesn't have a way to evaluate this. Um, and this is not something new. This has been going on forever because this paste-like structure of hashish, I think it just like, it, it's open to corruption, if you will. Um, and so this is another reason why it's really nice to make your own or have a community hash maker who's doing that work, because if they live in the community, I think you ha could have more confidence of, of what they're doing. Um, so on that point, <clears throat> I know Frenchie was a real big proponent of organic and regenerative cultivation practices. Uh, can you speak a little on why he was so adamant and, and felt that was so important? Well, I mean, he did a, a number of presentations where he kind of wrapped up the presentation and then said, look, we're 90 seconds away from the doomsday clock. And if we don't get our act together, um, your greed is going to be misfounded. You know, he used to say, so this whole green rush thing, you're all about making a profit off of this plant, but in 20 years, you're not gonna be able to spend that profit because we're gonna be extinct. And the misuse of packaging, you know, the regulations around packaging that require you to triple package it and seal it in plastic. And um, uh, he used to decry the hemp being grown in Colorado and uh, the plant, remnants just being left in the field, not recycled at all, no infrastructure being put in place to, you know, look at what the plant brings in terms of, you know, all the products that can be made from hemp and can be made from cannabis, but in 
a more um, regenerative and uh, you know positive way. So yeah, he had a lot of uh, emotion around that because he was really inspired by the work of Jack Herrera, who was I think the pioneer in really pointing out what a travesty it was that especially hemp had been made illegal in the United States under this misguided drug law, when in fact it was all about competition with other industries that did not want this plant to be successful because it would have wiped out the profitability of a lot of other industries if it was allowed to reach its full potential. Yeah, it's about the truth. <clears throat> I think DuPont was the big one behind it, but um, yeah, and, and you know, I did have a, a wonderful conversation with him about the fact that anecdotally he believed that the regenerative organic approach also would increase the, the uh, diversity or the complexity of the plant. Did he, did he speak of that much to you or in the movie? No, I mean, he talked about California was a candy land of cannabis um, that, you know, when we were young, when you think of it, there wasn't the as many cultivars or we weren't aware of the uniqueness of um, local land races. Well, there just weren't. The breeding, you know, hadn't been done to the degree that it's been done now. And so, you know, we, he used to say we had five or six um, choices. We had Morocco, Lebanon, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, um, you know, Turkey, Egypt, that Middle Eastern area. Um, and that when he came to California, suddenly it was like being in a candy land and things were unlimited. And that, um, you know, with the more and more science becoming available to us, that young breeders were going to be able to do incredible things that we were going to have designer cannabis in the future because people were going to understand the individual impacts that the cannabinoids had on our body, both on a physical therapeutic level and also on a psychological, you know, psychoactive level. And then the same thing with the terpenes. So somebody who was really knowledgeable would be able to, you know, craft a cocktail, if you will, of cannabinoids and terpenes to meet the very, you know, kind of specific needs of a consumer. Um, and that this was really exciting, that it wasn't all about flavor of the month. It was really about how, you know, this plant and these, these elements within this plant were going to be able to do amazing things for humankind if we allowed ourselves to be guided because he really felt that the plant was trying to guide us away from our own self-destruction. Agreed a hundred percent. I truly believe it's opened the lights and eyes and minds of so many farmers at this point in time that really start to understand that, you know, the, the traditional synthetic approach to growing is, is not doing us any favors. Um, and it's not providing us the potential the plant could give us. Uh, and the plants that they're growing. So in so many ways, he was spot on about it really, you know, giving, looking at, getting farmers to look at it and say, hey, wait a minute, this guy's growing or these people are growing this plant that's very similar to a tomato as far as being a nutrient pig. And they're not using any nitrogen. And so, yeah, it's it's really had a big impact. And, and I think it will continue to do so, especially as the demonization comes off of it. Um, but there was another point that I really wanted to talk about a little bit, and that is that the, the traditional way of making um, this hash also made it last. So if you just have flour, the flour begins to degrade mm -hmm. uh, in a relatively short period of time, within a year or so. But the hash doesn't degrade, does it? I mean, over time, oxidation will degrade anything, right? Uh, if, if it's around long enough. But if well stored, if you store it in a dark container without light exposure and with trying to limiting the exposure to oxygen in a dry, cool place, almost like wine, um, it will last a long time. We don't have tests that tell us exactly how much. We did 
um, a short series of tests with a um, lab in Canada called High North because this was an area that Frenchie had a lot of passion around was determining what was kind of the optimum storage time based on science because he once smoked a 12 year old Royal Nepalese temple ball in Nepal back in, it would have been in like 1978, 79. And um, he said it was an extraordinary thing that somehow they had a technology and I can't decide if this is urban legend or if it exactly, exactly exists. Cause I've never seen um, a lot of documentation around it, but the theory was you would take, so it was charas. It was the, um, material rubbed from the live plants and when you would make um, that it would come off in little fingers you'd have like these little strips of um, the cannabis uh, concentrate so you would take a few of them and press them all together until it became very homogenized and then take an enamel plate and roll this in a ball on top of the enamel plate and I think my theory is that this is creating some heat in the interior that's rising some of the oils to the surface. And when you let it dry, it creates a very hard shell. Because Frenchie said when he saw this Royal Nepalese temple ball, it looked like an ostrich egg sitting on this shelf in this person's house where he was invited to, to visit. And this person, um, this Nepalese person took this ball and he took like a point of a knife and made little holes all around it and then cracked it open and he leaned forward to Frenchie to show him and like smell and Frenchie said the inside was like glistening like caviar but the terps exploded in his face so strongly he was sitting kind of um, kneeling down that he fell back on his butt that he was just like he doesn't remember again the smoke but he remembers the experience of being like whoa how is it possible that the terpenes there's such a rich you know explosion of terpenes for something that's been stored so long because he had no concept of long-term hash storage at that time and that planted the seed in his brain of there is a whole area of this hashish exploration that we have no idea of and that was further supported. There was a study done, I think it was in 2014, by a group at a university in Nice. And they were doing study on what's the profile, the cannabinoid and terpene profile of the um, dried flower, and what is the profile in hashish. And they found that there were rare monoterpenes in the hashish that were not present in the flower. And they felt that this was so representative of the hashish, they called this terpene hashishin. Um, so this is something that I think is going to be so interesting for us to explore further too, is what's happening with these terpenes, not only when it's just transformed into hashish, but as we age it and as things ebb and flow because they're working their magic that we don't fully understand yet, or at least, I haven't met somebody who's explained it in depth to me. I'm sure there's scientists out there that understand for far more about that than I do. And I would love to have somebody talk to us about that. And uh, I think, and Frenchie felt too, that this is an unexplored area that's going to be a little bit like maybe fine wines in the future. Um, maybe when somebody has a baby, you give them a nice chunk of hashish and you say, okay, this is for you to smoke when the baby's, 18 or 21. Um, That's a beautiful concept. I love that. Right? Um, so just to speak a little bit more on, on what you just said, and, and this is, again, anecdotal in my experience, but um, there was a time when I drove Frenchie from the Regen Conference in Humble down to home. Um, we had a wonderful, I don't know, three and a half hour car ride together. <clears throat> and at the end of it, he, he got out of the car, thanked me, he started heading up to the house. And all of a sudden he spun around and he ran back down. He goes, oh, I need to give you this. <laughs> I can't do his accent. but And he snapped open uh, a, a temple ball in half and, and, and presented it to me. And I was like, oh, you don't need to do that, Frenchie. We're all good. And he's like, no, no, no. I, I want you to have this. And I noticed that the outside was a shell. It was, it was almost like a different color. And the inside was, was more pliable. So... I think 
I think there's something to do with that, that, that heating process, whether it's, you know, static energy or low temp definitely affects the way that, that it creates that shell around the outside edge of it. Well, and Frenchie used to create the temple balls where he would roll them in his hands so that you would have, and he would like to have a certain mass, you know, like, I don't know, five, 20 grams of, because then you have more surface area inside for the terpenes to work their magic. And in doing that rubbing, you're right. Uh, uh, if you've done it correctly and you know, you're working with material that's dry, a little bit of those oils are going to come to the surface and it's not going to create that perfect shell like he saw with the Royal Nepalese temple ball. I'm not sure if that was something to do with the cultivar because a lot of what we're doing just has too much resin almost to make that happen. But you will see, like if you store it in a jar, there will be parts that separate and um, just do all kinds of cool stuff over time. So in the video that's being released, does he show how he would dry sieve and then fold and roll and fold and roll with, with a hot piece of uh, glass? Because I found that. Hot water bottle. So no, those are already available on our website. If you go to frenchycannoli.com forward slash DIY, the, that's a four part series. There's a washing video, there's a drying video, there's a pressing video, there's one on evaluating quality. And that's the series that does have the subtitles in six languages. So um, yeah, a lot of choices already there for do it yourself patch making content. Um, and Ken, do you have, have you put up the where to find it? Yes, right? Yes, there it is. Cool. Uh, well, yeah, actually, you can get it on the uh, um, FrenchyCanoli.com. All of that's on that, right? Um, that, but that's, you know, that's a, a beautiful lead into to talking a little bit more about the, the film. Is, uh, th those were all done by Jake as well, mm -hmm. uh, yes. The Lost Art, um, which I, I'd love to, I'd love to know more about, um, yeah. How did that relationship form with with Jake, and then and then going on to to create the uh, Frenchy Dreams of Hash Hashish film? So we were looking for somebody to do those. Well, before the workshop videos, we actually did a four part do it yourself. How do you smoke hash? Because if we take it a step back further, in the early two thousands, Frenchy was going to all these cannabis conferences and events and super sessions that they used to hold in baseball stadiums in SoCal. And, you know, he was kind of this little cute old guy with a strong accent. And so the young people would always be like, so what do you do in the industry? And he would say, I'm a hash maker. And because the war on drugs was so successful in the U.S., they didn't have a clue what hashish was. And so they would say, what's hash? And he would be like, let me show no, you. No. And so, you know, like he did with Leighton, he would break off a piece and show them and then they would and give it to them. And they would be like, well, but what do I do with this? How do I smoke this? That was the big question. So we made a four part series also in how to smoke. And this um, is just self-explanatory. No, no uh, subtitles required. There's one on how to put roll hashish in a joint, one on smoking with a hookah, one on how to dab with hashish, and one on how to um, smoke with a shilong. And those okay. are all on our YouTube page, on the Frenchy Cannoli YouTube page. Okay. And um, so when we were doing that, my daughter uh, was in New York after college, and she was in performing arts. She was in theater and dance. And so I told her, I need somebody to help me do these videos. Do you know anybody? And her boyfriend at the time introduced us to Jake. And we were just about getting ready to go to Spanibus. So we were exploring this idea, shall we work together? Why don't you join us at Spanibus? And so that was Jake's entry into following Frenchie around Barcelona during Spanibus, which I don't know if any of you have ever been to Spanibus. It's like crazy intense, all these social clubs, all these events. Um, they had a great time together. So then it was come out to Oakland and do the smoking videos, do the workshop videos. And that ultimately <laughs> into 
come up with me to visit the farms. Amazing. Um, I was just wondering if, if um, now, uh, I, I noticed uh, Silly Lily wrote uh, that, you know, just values all the work that you're doing to keep those memories of, of Frenchie going. But it's it's more than that. You're 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 doing a lot more of 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 the work um, in in terms of you and Belle are still pr producing hash. Yes, um, there is. You, well, she's still? producing hash. I'm not producing. Belle is now director of operations for um, one of the better uh, dispensaries in California called Heritage Mendocino. But she and I are still carrying on Fre Frenchie's legacy, planting the seeds, doing his workshops. And. And yeah, doing the workshops. Are, um, is is Belle getting up to visit the farmers as well? Is that still oh, happening? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. She works. And if you look at her Instagram, she's cherry blossom underscore Belle on Instagram. She has some beautiful site visit um, video clips. Um, she's got a five hundred gallon machine at the facility that she's operating there. Um, beautiful clips of some of the work that they're doing. The cultivars that they're working with are just amazing. Um, so yeah, she's carrying on the legacy. Uh, Frenchie, I, I'm sure, is just like couldn't be more proud. I think we're both uh, quite excited to to uh, to grab. I think I think you and Bell might be uh, coming up to Edmonton. Uh, in the we are Edmonton. looking forward to that. Yeah, we are very much looking mm -hmm. forward to visiting Canada again. Um, yeah. We love Canada. Frenchie loved Canada. Oh, we were... <laughs> <laughs> um, it, of course, the Grow Up Conference was blessed by having the, the first uh, Canadian premiere of, of uh, Frenchie Dreams of Hash or Hashish. And and it was it it was just so amazing because there were so many amazing hash uh, makers there in the audience uh, in Canada who were all motivated, um, inspired by by Frenchie. So that was just an absolutely amazing uh, opportunity. One of the uh, one of the other things I just I, I it always blows my mind, especially you know with the, with the title of the lost art uh, of Hashish is how much science you know Frenchie had had with 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 him. It was. Yes, it was. There was a, a a lost art, but my God, did he know his science uh, around around the plant and and around hash? Because it was really important, you know, because he had lived so many years with, like everybody, basically assuming. Because unless you were a researcher, you couldn't go to the library back in the day and say, "Oh, by the way, can I get a book on cannabis science?" You know, they'd call the police. Um, so I think being in isolation when you're curious and you have like Frenchie, I mean, he was an artist, but he was also somebody who was very process oriented. He looked at the structure of the plant. He thought about the tools and how they were going to be used in the most efficient way to carefully remove that trichome head as intact as possible. And so it was his great delight when the internet suddenly became this library that didn't have limitations based on the war on drugs. And that, you know, as things opened up, we had more and more people studying that. And so we were starting to get some concrete fact on what we were dealing with. We were starting to understand. I mean, he used to joke, we didn't even know what a trichome was back in the day. We called it pollen in France, you know? Um, and it, it has nothing to do with pollen. <laughs> So that was, yeah, that was a great joy. I think in a perfect world, Frenchie would have been this archaeologist slash scientist given the opportunity, you know, the Indiana Jones of cannabis, basically. Well, in many ways he was. <laughs> <laughs> so finding that temple ball. Um, yeah, uh, I was just, I was, I'd like to get, um, more information about this event that's happening on April 29th. Um, how, how do people find out more about um, so participating? Heard, and what's, what, what is the, what's the whole day about? Okay, so it's a little bit about the celebration of the film, obviously, but it's also trying to do what we've had at the films. At each of the films, we've had a Q&A after the film, and in some cases, we've been able to have after parties where we could get together and celebrate as a community in the way that we were used to celebrating. And that's felt very therapeutic, um, especially after the pandemic, when 
part of the culture has always been to get together and smoke together. And symbolic to this was Frenchie's use of a multi-hose hookah. So he okay. used to take this multi-hose hookah to the emerald cup and the other cups and using this Quasar shisha bowl, fill it with hashish and then invite people to just enjoy themselves. So we want to try to replicate that kind of celebration virtually um, by having this hookah sesh online where after the film, after, so everybody will view the film in their own home or, it, you know, I think some people are going to organize some events where people can get together and actually physically watch the film together and then have the after party together. But we'll have a Q and A, um, we'll show people how to use the hookah um, with the hashish because that's a new thing for some people. The reason that we really started to like this so much beyond the fact that it's a super economical way to consume hashish because it lasts forever when you use the quasar shisha. It's almost like vaping it so you can, a small quantity goes a long way. When we were in Denver at one event, it was kind of that classic thing where you have a cannabis event, but they don't allow smoking in the event. You have to go out back behind the building to smoke. So all the cool people are out back behind the dumpsters. And Frenchie found a table and we set the hookah up back there at this Denver event. And so we were all smoking and I was standing there. And at one point, the guy next to me, he turned to me and it was the first time he had smoked the hookah. And he said, this is like sharing a lung with four other people. It's magical. And I remember just being like, oh my God, it's so true that the hookah is like the, you know, mycelium of the of the cannabis community that through this, or maybe the smoke even, because it doesn't have to be the hookah, right? That through the smoke, people who maybe wouldn't talk to each other on the street or wouldn't somehow meet each other found community and found acceptance because we were to a large over if you're over a certain age you were marginalized as a cannabis consumer and maybe even you were almost tracked and hounded you know because the police were after us in the 80s quite a bit and harassed us a lot um so yeah for me that was just this beautiful kind of image of what we were trying to achieve with the film so i'm going to try and achieve some of that virtually. So I'm inviting people who have event spaces to put on events, you know, sell tickets, give a portion of their ticket proceeds to the Origins Council, which is this nonprofit in Northern California. They're doing a study on cannabis terroir with some of the farmers featured in the film. And so 20% of all of our ticket sale proceeds are going to support that project. And so this is a way for me to fundraise a little bit, but also to create these online events where we can talk about the film. People can ask us about, you know, various aspects of what they saw. They can share with us their experience of seeing the film. And I'm just hoping we uh, generate a lot of cool buzz uh, together uh, about the film, because in my perfect world, it would be picked up by some streaming entity so that people outside the community see it and they realize they're just farmers, that this is no different than farming tomatoes or corn or, the president of uh, Columbia said it recently that we're looking at this plant wrong. It shouldn't be taxed the way it's taxed. It shouldn't be processed the way it's processed, that this is no different than corn, he said. And to agree, he's right. I mean, if you can sell cilantro in the store um, and not have heavy taxes or heavy prohibition on it. Cannabis is just another herb to a certain degree. Agreed, 100%. Um, Go ahead, Ash, sorry. I was just, I, I'm intrigued by uh, the, the work of the Origins Council and, and uh, this, this concept of terroir. Are they, are they looking to create appellations or are they doing more? So it's, um, the Origins Council does all kinds of work um, in the cannabis uh, space legally, not just around this project that they're doing with the Lost Coast Farmers Guild, which are some of the farmers featured in the film, um, but they've been very active in some of the lobbying efforts to change some of the regulations in cannabis that are so onerous to the small farmers here. Um, when it comes to this project, the idea is to create a protocol 
around how to approach defining a cannabis terroir, because this is the foundation for creating an appellation. And so this would be a good thing for not only the farmers of NorCal to have, but um, people elsewhere ultimately as well. Um, so that, because when you look at traditionally how an appellation is formed, if you follow the, you know, the French uh, prototype, there's a recognition of the product that precedes the actual appellation. So there's an understanding like when they made Bordeaux, oh, the, the cultivar grown in this land by these farmers creates a very recognizable type of wine that is, has a quality. And it's almost like you could say it has a, it's a taste of that place. You know, like if you were to blind, you know, put a bunch of different wines and somebody who really knew their flavor would taste all of them, they would be able to say, oh, that's the Bordeaux. And so it's similar with cannabis grown in various regions. You know, when you go to NorCal, people are like, there's a reason that NorCal cannabis is so popular. It has a very distinctive flavor, especially the stuff grown outside. It tastes, it smells like the environment that it's coming from. I mean, you know this, Leighton, um, from having spent time up north, you know, that the microclimates that they have there, we have so much water that's coming to the plants from the sea breezes, that uh, the, the fog that comes off the ocean that is also nurturing all of those pine trees in the area. And then we have the soul of all of those small farmers that are often multi-generational that have been protecting and caring for this land for a long time. So there's just something special in many parts of the world, these dedicated farming communities that have been doing this for generations. And I'm thinking of places in Lebanon and Afghanistan as well that should be protected, you know, that should have these kind of um, marketing protections. So at one point I thought I thought they actually already did create the Appalachians up in in Humboldt. No, I think that... what they did was um, more of like what they've done it with wine in Napa, and it's a naming convention that basically says if it's grown here, it's packaged here, you can say on the label "made in Humboldt." So it's a made in Humboldt or made in Mendocino situation, but it's not actually tied to a specific piece of land or a specific area within that overall geography. And are they planning to try to push that through too? Or are they just gonna say, oh, you're from the Emerald Triangle and this is this is your- triangle. No, I think the long-term idea is to go for appellations in the traditional European sense of the word, because there are legal protections around that that are recognized in Europe. Great, fantastic. Yeah, I talked to Kevin Jodry about that a couple of years back, and he said that they were pushing it, but I had no idea that they gotten anywhere because that's not something easy to do. No, not at all. Yeah. But you're absolutely right about the microclimates. I mean, that is such a special place that the fog brings brings in all of these minerals from the salt water, mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 heat, the, the the intensity, the UVs from from the sun up there is is similar to Southern California, but it's not the same. It's just, it's very unique up there in the hills. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly the elevations up there, but some of those peaks are pretty high. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not the Himalayas, but yeah, it's not <laughs> San Francisco either. <laughs> um, well, listen, I know you've got to bounce in about 10 minutes. Ah, was there anything else that you wanted to ask her or should we open up the questions or? I know I, I'm I'm just more excited about learning about April 29th and and I know I know uh, I'm going to try to uh, uh, either either pay for some of my students to 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 watch it. I think my my class is over, but uh, but hopefully they'll they'll uh, want to participate in some capacity. And I'll uh, I first need to check out how to uh, to to. To smoke in a shillam. That's that's uh, that's how I usually smoke my flower. But uh, I'll I'll watch that video to find out how how uh, how Frenchy smoked the uh, uh, hash. Cool. Yeah, we have the whole dedicated website on Frenchy dreams of hashish. Um, so we have the FrenchyCanoli.com, but there's also one just dedicated to the film, and it's Frenchy dreams of hashish. And um, 
you can see the uh, trailer for the film on there. There is a letter from the filmmaker. We've got um, the press release, some reviews we've had. Um, there's a wealth of information about the film on the site. And I did put one page up about um, the event on the 29th and I'll be posting more. I've just been kind of working out a little bit the details and trying to create this as flexible and open as inexpensive and accessible so that everybody can participate and enjoy and that we can just have, I'm hoping, you know, like virtually some real cool experiences together, um, some fun with the hookah and uh, meeting a bunch of people from the film. Yeah. Nice, nice. So are you gonna actually personally have a party, an after party? So um, I will be either in San Francisco or Los Angeles. I'm working out the details, um, but yeah, the, there will be a party. Nice, nice. Well, definitely keep us all posted. DM me when you want me to post up about this. I, I you know, I, I loved Frenchie like a brother, and you know, I'd be happy and honored to be able to send out as much information as I can so that as many people can participate. Um, Thank yeah, you. I. I was blessed to have smoked out of that hookah. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about, he used to, what was his term? You got to smoke them up. What, what was it? Smoke them out. He smoke them out, right? Smoke He's like, out. we're going to yeah. smoke you all out. <laughs> 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 oh, man. You take yeah, two there, there's cute footage in that, in the do it yourself hookah video. And Frenchie's standing on the table and fanning, because that was before we had the quasar. Um, Shisha and he he was fanning the coals, but yeah, he really looks like the Pied Piper of uh, <laughs> Ashish on the top of this table and everybody's got the hoses around the table and they're passing it back and forth to each other uh, with good memories. Amen to that. Amen. Yeah, we did a, another event. I think it was called um, the Dragonfly Hive Meeting where he brought that hook up again yeah. and, and put it out on the middle of the table on the back deck and just you could just walk by it because everybody was smoking it so hard. It was just it was like a cloud that was just yeah, hovering. Yeah. <laughs> a little mushroom cloud of hashish. Yep. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> well, I don't know if there were any questions, Ken. Uh, I don't want to keep her after the timeline. No, everybody's talking about Spanabis. They're talking about uh, going to the website, seeing the movie. Madame Canoli, if you could send me the link. Uh, for the other website and I will add it into uh, the description on YouTube that I have for this one. Um, and yes, definitely we need to be kept posted so we can bring this out and keep people enthused about it. it it's Thank really, yeah. yeah. Also, I should tell you that we have one other resource to support people in their hash making efforts. And that was Frenchie had um, the Lost Art Group on Facebook. And so I'm there as well as another uh, a number of other, you know, really good hash makers to provide, um, answer people's questions, provide guidance, and just basically geek out on, on hash making. So, um, and within that, Facebook has this thing when you have a group that's called the guides, and we just basically turned it into a library. It's 24 folders of information on different aspects of hash making. There's historical stuff. There's kind of the basics. Um, just a wealth of information. So you're welcome to come stealth mode and just check out the library. You don't have to post anything. There's no participation requirements. Oh, so awesome. I'm going to want that link too, so I can add that into the description. <laughs> uh, I, I never had the opportunity to meet Frenchie, but I've seen a lot of his videos. I watched him teach courses with the, the machine that he created, the Vortex machine for washing. And I was like blown away. It's like, wow. So, well, that, whose yeah. dog is that? That's mine. I have a bouvier. That's Frenchie's bouvier. And he gets all wound up. He thinks the whole neighborhood is his territory. And, uh, yeah, he's a little bit too much, honestly. I'm surprised Poe isn't answering and my dogs aren't answering as well because it's like they normally get set up on that, right? Maybe, 
Here he is. I, I call him to say hi to everybody. Okay, be quiet. Oh. You're upsetting everybody. I change. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I'll get him for you. There you go. And like Silly Lily says, Leighton, there's the star yeah. of the show. Yeah. Right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. He really is a piece of work, aren't you? Aren't you? Yeah, you so are. So how about I run the uh, uh, next show in an hour's time, guys? Uh, we've got the Michi boys. Those two boys are are just incredibly beautiful spirits, and and their sisters as well. That whole family is just amazing. So yeah, I'm glad yeah. that you're doing that. And Mom Canoli, Kimberly, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, my I really, <laughs> really appreciate it, and and love the man dearly, and miss him horribly. So if you do end up coming down to LA, please do let me know. Um, love to either meet you on the way down or up, or if I can get down to the event, I will for sure. That sounds great. And uh, was the was the um, was the other websites? I know that was the Facebook, the dot com. But is the Frenchie loves hash? Is that a dot com as well? Yes. So Frenchie dreams of hashish dot com. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go, Ken. So now you can you can slap it up in the in the notes uh, for other people to see. Yeah, definitely. Um... I, I can't wait to watch the movie myself. I've been looking forward to being able to watch it uh, since it was announced. So thank you. I know much. a lot of people have been very impatient. We submitted it to a couple of film festivals and the requirement for submitting it to the film festival was that we couldn't release it elsewhere mm -hmm. um, in specific cities. So we were waiting to see how that panned out. And now we've made the commitment to the, um, April 29th on online release. Nice. Oh, that's fantastic. Perfect. And I hope that you do have some good support staff for, for all the video work and connecting. Like, I don't know if it's going to be done through Zoom or what. Um, so that the app I'm going to use Restream. And what the beauty of Restream is that people can just log on to their favorite Frenchie way to access. So it'll be on Instagram, on the YouTube, on the Facebook, and on the LinkedIn. What are you doing? Um, so they won't have, you know, it just allows them to join in whatever one of those platforms they like best. And uh, yeah. And then also because the restream is a little bit like Zoom, nine people will be able to join me kind of like you have here to talk simultaneously. And then is there a cue to get in there? Like if someone wanted to ask you a question, do they like, so you'll just use the chat functionality in Instagram, YouTube, or Facebook, and it'll show up, and we'll be able to answer your questions or have people that are monitoring the uh, chat for each of those platforms to make sure that we don't miss anything. Oh, that's awesome. That's an amazing, amazing. Yeah, so I'm trying to you know keep it really simple, but uh, in such a way that Whatever platform people are already on, they can just use that, that they don't have to sign up for something else and give their yeah. email to some group that's going to sell it to God knows who, you know? Right. <laughs> Got enough of those. <laughs> so do you have any events coming up before that, uh, Madam Canoli, that uh, people could, could possibly get to or learn from? At this point, I don't think so. I'll be doing, you know, a bunch of podcasts like this. I'm trying to get the word out to as many people as possible. So I'm really looking for all the opportunities to speak to people on various live streams and on podcasts, you know, trying to really extend the knowledge of who we are and what we're doing, you know, kind of beyond our, our community. Um, we do also on the FrenchyCanoli.com page, we have an events page on there. So I try to keep all of our events up to date on the on the website, um, just so you know where to see us and where we're going to be. So in Edmonton, in the not too distant future, we're going to go visit and uh, we're going to be also in Vermont. I think that's in May. Um, and a few other areas. We tentatively hope to go to Mexico in September. 
um, yeah. Oh, you're getting to, around. <laughs> I did do a few things with Bell, you know, and uh, just get out there and uh, yeah, see some people. So where yeah. are you going to be in Vermont? There's an event there called Nick Can, and um, I'm not sure what city it's in. One of the main cities there. Okay. All right. Good enough. Well, just keep us informed of when these things are happening so that we can get the word out there because I know there's a big community of hash makers in New England and they would love to get the opportunity to meet you. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. It's been a while that uh, people have been asking. So, yeah, we're very much looking forward to going to visit. Cool. Well, we won't hold you any longer. We, we did our hour. Thank you so much again for joining oh, us. Pleasure. Ken, thanks for producing. It was a pleasure to always have you as a partner. So thank you so much, all of you. And all four of us are going to be in Edmonton for the grow up. So that's going to be awesome, too. Oh, Maybe nice. we can do a live stream. Nice. Right. That'd be really great. Yeah. I think uh, Bell's going to join us as well. And I know we're going to have some nice panel discussions. So I'm very much looking forward to that and seeing that area. All right, bring the pipe. Bring the hookah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, the hash. we'll just make one locally. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll make sure that we have one locally, and uh, yeah, we'll have some fun. There you go. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Take care. Right, thanks, everyone. And with that, guys, uh, we'll run the the next trailer for next week's show, and uh, then we'll close the stream. Thanks, guys. That was lovely. Yes, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, Kimberly. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Peace out, everybody.